I want to thank you all for your prayers this week. Uh, Ariana, my daughter, ha- came through her surgery great. It was six hours. She came through the surgery. And I'll tell you, already the next day after the surgery, she was doing so much better than she did the last time they did it. So we are praising God and know that God is, yes, thank you. And I also want to apologize right out of the gate for my raspy voice. It was such a nice warm week, but you know, with warm week comes the flowers, and with the flowers comes the pollen. That reminds us we live in a fallen world. I find it very interesting that if you look at a, a, a particle of pollen under a microscope, it looks identical to the Death Star in Star Wars. <laughs> I think that is very fitting. Uh, let's start this morning. Let's, um, if you would, would you join me? Let's turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. Let's stand out of reverence for God while we read this this morning. Reading from Luke 14. I want to start reading in verse 12. And Jesus also said to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. You'll be blessed because they cannot repay you or you will be repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. One of the dinner guests upon hearing this said to him, blessed is anyone who will eat the bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. And at the time for dinner, he sent his slave or his servant out to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have been married and therefore I cannot make it. So the servant returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, sir, What you have ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. It's our time. We must rise up and no longer disparage. It's our time, church, to honor our heritage. We have a savior. He gave it all on the cross. We stand beside martyrs who counted nothing as loss. They took God's mysteries, opened them up for us. Stephen, John the Baptist, Bonhoeffer, Jan Hus. Surrounded by a cloud of witnesses above, it's now our turn to model his unending love. Our mission is one we cannot confuse, nor muddy up with some trite excuse. You say you're not well-versed, ready, or able. I think Moses even tried to use that fable. The time we have, it's now more urgent. If we should hear, well done, faithful servant. Yeah, church, it's our time. It's our time to confess the ways we're mangled, the sins and selfishness that have us entangled. Lust, greed, and pride, their path leads to the grave. Yet we return to our sins as if we're a slave. Can we survive in this putrid dead sea? I quote Paul, may it never be. So let's cast aside our individual leprosy and begin to leave a biblical legacy. There's a glorious prize awaiting to be won, and the way to win is to start to run. Let's lace them up and fight the good fight, become to the world both salt and light. Our life on earth is merely a vapor. Our chapter must move from pen to paper. So church, let's get to writing because it's our time. It's our time, church. We have what it takes to help the world from its slumber awake. To Jesus, we are his beautiful bride. Whom shall we fear with him on our side? We have each other. We are not alone. It's iron to iron in the combat zone. 
There's a promise of life full of adventure. As long as we give both talents and treasure, the workers are few, the harvest is plenty, with so many lives running on empty. Scores of people trying to cope, they've come to the end of their proverbial rope. Young eyes are wandering, looking for direction. Make sure we point them to His resurrection. The clock's ticking, we're on our dime. Hey church, rise up! It's our time. What a powerful message that is for us. I, I want to, this morning, I want to kind of close out our series on the book of Proverbs. We've been calling it Wisdom Highway. It's part of a bigger series we've been doing called Route 66 that we're doing over the next three to four years. And in this series, what we are seeking to do is to move through the 66 books of the Bible. And so as we have been going through this series, uh, I want to kind of reveal, I want to take a moment and summarize the book and also summarize what we have learned so far. Proverbs is a wonderful collection of sayings. There's great teachings that come mainly uh, from King Solomon. And the book of Proverbs imparts practical advice on various aspects of life. It emphasizes first and foremost the fear of the Lord, the need for righteous living, the importance of having wisdom, seeking after wisdom, and having wisdom. And in this series, we've covered such topics as morality, diligence, humility, and the consequence of both wise and foolish choices. Proverbs offers timeless insight for leading a virtuous and a fulfilling life. And today I want to look at Proverbs chapter 31. I want to encourage you to take out the insert that you got when you came in. It has notes for today's sermon. And we're going to kind of skip around in the Bible, but let's start today in Proverbs chapter uh, 31. And I want to read verses 8 and 9. Speak out for those who cannot speak. For the rights of all who are destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and of the needy. And now let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs 19, and I want to read verse 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will be repaid in full. As we close this series today, I want to focus on one final instruction throughout the book of Proverbs, which is easily lost in today's society. In a world that promotes power and wealth and prestige over loving our neighbors, over helping those who are struggling, Proverbs has a lasting message for those who seek wisdom, to speak up for those who are needy, to care for those who are needy. Today is March 17th, it's St. Patrick's Day, so in keeping with that, I want to share with you a story about one who sought after power and prestige and wealth. I want to tell you about my friend Patty. You see, Patty decided he had gotten together with his buddies, and so he called the Kremlin and asked to talk to Putin. Putin got on the phone, and Patty stated, Ah, oh, Mr. Putin, me and the boys down here at the pub have been talking. We don't like that you uh, went into Ukraine and we're going to do something about it. Me and the boys decided we're coming to attack you there in Russia. We're going to overthrow Russia and make it part of Ireland. Putin said, are you kidding me? You and the boys at the pub? I have hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Oh, nobody told me that. I'll have to call you back. <laughs> A couple of minutes later, the phone rang at the Kremlin. It's Patty again. The war is back on. Me and the boys were talking, and you know, we now have power. We've decided we're going airborne. We've got our own navy. We got a Cessna, and the boys have got their weapons, and we climbed in, and we've got a navy now. We're coming to bomb you. Putin says, you idiots. I have more jets than you can imagine. I have anti-aircraft missiles. Ah, nobody told me that, Mr. Putin. We'll have to call you back. <laughs> a couple minutes later, the phone rang at the Kremlin. Ah, it's Patty again. The war's back on. Me and the boys decided we now have prestige and wealth. 
We have gone ahead and launched a navy. One of the boys has a canoe and we've loaded up all the weapons in the canoe. We've got a navy now. You idiots, do you know how many battleships I have and how many submarines? Ah, nobody told me that. I'll have to call you back. A minute later, the phone rang and Putin says, stop, don't say another word. You've irritated me so much since I talked to you last. I just deployed 100,000 more soldiers. I'm sending them to Ireland. Oh, just a second, Mr. Putin. Comes back on, ah, Mr. Putin, it's Patty again, the war is off. I'm sorry to hear that. Why is the war off? Well, me and the boys were talking and we realized that we're just a small country in Ireland. We can't house hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war here in our country. (laughs) The pride of Ireland. (laughs) You see, our Proverbs tells us not to seek after power, not to seek after wealth, not to be like the world today where the nations are shaking their sabers threatening one another, not to be like the world today that is so divided, so torn apart, but to come together to care, to speak up for those who cannot support themselves, to speak up for the right of those who are destitute. So how do we do that? What does that look like in the life of the church? Well, in your insert, uh, let's go through that together real quickly. In your insert, it's kind of We're going to work through that first. To speak up, you need to see. In order to see, you need to set out. To set out, you need to be sent. And to be sent, you need to be surrendered. Let's start with the first point. To speak up, you need to see. To speak up, you need to see. I've preached on this before, so I don't want to get into it very much. I just want to quickly review Acts chapter 3. In Acts 3, Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray. It's an hour of prayer. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. And as they're going to the temple to pray, there was a man who was lame from birth that was sitting by the gate beautiful, one of the outer gates leading into the temple. And he's sitting there and he's crying out, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. And as Peter and John go by, Peter says, silver and gold have us none, but in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. But I want to go to verse four of chapter three. It says, and Peter Fixing his eyes on him, as did John, Peter said, look at us. Let's stop and talk about that for a minute. Why is that so significant? Because as Peter and John are walking by, they turn and they acknowledge the need. They see the man that's sitting there. In order to speak up for those in need, we first need to see them. And that's so counterculture to how we are today. We don't like to look at the need. We like to ignore it. We like to be comfortable in our house, comfortable in our churches. We don't want to acknowledge the needs that are around us, the needs of those who are destitute, the needs of those who are disenfranchised, the needs of those who are needy, the needs of those who are poor and suffering. We don't want to look at them because if we don't look at them, we can tell ourselves they don't exist. Peter and John acknowledge the need. I love how it says it. And one of the verses says, and Peter cast his eyes upon him as did John. They both looked at the man. And then they said something powerful. They said to the man, look at, look at us. Why did they say that? Those of you who have worked or volunteered at our clinics or have volunteered at Living Water Community Center, or, or I mean at Living Water, uh, our Living Water Clinics are the Brisbane Center or some of the other ministries we do. You've seen that when people come in, they often are looking down. And why are they looking down? They're ashamed. They're ashamed of their situation. Peter doesn't let this man be ashamed. He says, look up. Look at us. Because we want you to look beyond us. We want you to look to God who can take care of your problem. Church family, in order to speak up for those who are destitute, those who are needy, we need to first see the need. Isaiah 58, verse 6 through 8 says, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen that will loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? Now listen, this is what God is saying. This is the kind of fasting he requires. Y'all know what fasting is. This is the kind of fasting that God requires to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke, to share your food with the hungry, to provide for the poor and the wanderer with shelter, When you see the naked, to clothe them, to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then, 
And only then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of your Lord will be your rear guard. (laughs) Think about that. That is what God is calling us to do. That is the only thing he said that will break forth, that will untie the cord of the yoke, that will loose the chains of injustice in our society. What is it? To give to those in need. To care for those who are destitute. Then and only then will your light break forth. Or as Jesus said in Matthew, let your light shine that men may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. You cannot speak up for the need until you look at the need and acknowledge it. The need in your community, the need in your workplace, the needs around the world. But in order to see the need, You need to set out. You need to get out of your comfort zone. You need to go out. You can't stay in the four walls of your home, the four walls of your church with our head in the sand. We've got to get out there in order to see the need. John 14, our gospel reading today, then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon, when you give a dinner, when you give a banquet, don't go and invite your friends. Don't invite your brothers or your sisters, your relatives. Don't go invite your rich neighbors. If you do, they're going to invite you back and you're going to be paid, you're going to be rewarded. But when you do it, give to those, those who are poor, crippled, lame, and blind, and you will be blessed. Why? Because although they cannot repay you, I will repay you at the day of the resurrection of the righteous. This morning, at our services, we were joined by our Rise friends. You saw them down here this morning doing a wonderful job singing. I love to hear them sing and proclaim the goodness of God. Our RISE ministry, RISE stands for Religious Instruction in Special Education. And a few years ago, my wife and I were burdened to start that ministry in our church to begin a program called RISE because we both, uh, we we have a, a sibling who is intellectually disabled and blind, and we're very burdened for that community. And so RISE reaches the adults in our community with a love of Christ give them a a place that they can come and eat. They eat together every Thursday night. They they worship together. They have Bible time. They do crafts and activities. We have things out in the community where they're going out and they're, they're going to the theater to see a play. They're going to movies. They're going and doing things as a group. They're very active, very active group. And church family, that is what we've been told to do. That when we give a luncheon or a dinner, When we, as a church, invite to go to those who are poor, those who are disenfranchised, go to those in our community that are disabled. But we don't want to stop there. We're so glad what God is doing. But I know there are two ladies in our church who have been talking about how do we get Rise Kids started. Program for our boys and girls in the community that are disabled. And once we get that program going, we don't want to stop there because then we're going to look at how can we get Rise Youth started, a program reaching those youth in our community who are disabled. You see, we need to be about the business that God has called us to. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. I want to read this out of the message because I love the way that he translates this. Go into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air. Don't you love that? A breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night. That's what we've been called to do. To go into a world that is polluted and corrupted, and boy, is this world polluted and corrupted. The greed, the envy, the lust that we see around us, go into this world uncorrupted and be a breath of fresh air. There are so many that need that breath of fresh air. Carry the life-giving message into the night. In keeping with St. Patrick's Day, let me share with you a true story. There was a one-legged school teacher 
from Ireland that came to J. Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor was the uh, director and the founder of uh, China Inland Mission. And he came to Hudson Taylor to offer himself in service to China. With only one leg, why do you think of going as a missionary? Hudson Taylor asked. I love his answer. George Scott answered, I do not see those with two legs going. (laughs) He was accepted on the spot. (laughs) You see, George Scott saw a need. He knew he needed to go to those who were needy, those who were destitute. And so he did that in his own community. Then he said, Lord, send me to China. I'll do it in China as well. To speak, you need to see. To see, you need to get out of your comfort zone. You need to get out of the four walls. You need to set out. To set out, you need to be sent. To set out, you need to be sent. Again, from our gospel, John 14. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. I love that picture. We know what he's talking about. What is this parable talking about? It's talking about the marriage feast of the Lamb, the great feast that we'll have, the feast that's prepared for the righteous in heaven when we're done with this whole life. And I love that when he's talking about the feast, he says, I want you to go and invite them to come in. And who does he invite before anybody else? (laughs) The disenfranchised, the poor, the needy, those, in the dis- those who are disabled. Invite them. And then if there's more room, go into the highways and byways. Invite them to come in. When I was studying this passage, I asked myself, well, why go into the streets and invite them? And I was thinking back, well, we know during that time, if you were disabled uh, in any way, you were looked at as a second or third class citizen. You couldn't hold a job. And so the only job you could do was to be in the streets crying out alms for the poor. And I thought, wow, how sad. Isn't it great that we have gotten beyond that? Then I thought about the Brisbane Center. How many of you have worked at the Brisbane Center when our church has gone there to serve? And I thought about the homeless communities under bridges or in the woods and When you think about those communities, when you think about the Brisbane Center, those of you who've served there, what do you see among those who are homeless? Almost every one of them is disabled in some way. Whether it's intellectually disabled, emotionally disabled, or physically disabled. There are many veterans that are homeless. I guess we haven't come so far after all, have we? Go into the streets and bid them to come in. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. I think of that and I think of the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, that's a hard name. Let's talk about Mephibosheth for a minute. I've preached on him before, and Pastor Schaefer did last year as well. I think we both preached on him last year. Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son, King Saul's grandson. And King Saul and Jonathan were killed in a battle with the Philistines, and they overthrew. And and so uh, as the Philistines were coming into the towns and villages and cities, Mephibosheth's nanny picked him up, his nurse picked him up, and she began to run with him, and she fell. We don't know how, but she fell. She stumbled, and not only did she drop Mephibosheth, but she fell on him, and it broke his legs, and apparently it also broke his spine because he was unable to walk. He, He became lame, and he was that way the rest of his life. Well, uh, David <clears throat> overthrew the Philistines, was set as king over Israel. And one day David called his servants and he was talking with him and he said, is there anyone left in the family of Jonathan? Jonathan, Prince Jonathan, again, Saul's son, uh, Mephibosheth's father, it was uh, uh, David's best friend. He said, is there anyone left in the family of, of Jonathan? And they said, yes, he, he has a son, Mephibosheth, who's lame. David said, go at once and bring him to me. Can you imagine the soldiers come, knock on the door? 
Mephibosheth opens the door and there are these soldiers. Now during that day, when you became a king, one of your first tasks was to kill all of the remaining family members of the previous king so that they wouldn't try to overthrow you. So you can imagine how excited Mephibosheth was to see the king's soldiers there. And in fear and trembling, he went with them and stood before, well, not stood, I'm sorry, went before King David and David said, I will restore unto you all the land that belonged to your father, all of his servants, all of his wealth and his home. And he didn't stop there. He said, and you will feast at my table. All of your meals will be at the table of the king because you're going to become as my own son. Again, this is a picture of heaven. David was a picture of, of, of Christ inviting Mephibosheth, who is disabled, to come and sit at the table. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, the prophet says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, Lord, send me. We've been sent by God. How are we going to answer? Are we going to say, Here am I, Lord? Here am I, Lord. Send Tom. <laughs> Here am I, Lord, send Ron. <laughs> no, we need to answer as a prophet Isaiah. Here am I, Lord, send me. Send me. In order to be sent, you first have to be surrendered. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct your steps. Trusting in the Lord with all your heart lies at the very foundation of surrendering to God's guidance. It's an invitation to place our complete confidence, all of our resources, all of our desires in his unwavering wisdom, his goodness, his hand, knowing that his ways surpass our limited resources and our limited understanding. To trust in the Lord means you recognize the limitations of your own understanding. You acknowledge that he holds the ultimate wisdom. It requires us to release our grasp on control, to release our grasp on our resources and to surrender to him, to submit to his divine guidance. Trusting in God, yes, it's an act of surrender, a surrender of our own limited perspectives a recognition that his ways are higher than our ways and that his thoughts are far wiser than our thoughts will ever be. The concept of surrendering to God and reaching out to the needy, reaching out to the disabled, is often rooted in biblical and Christian principles that are found all throughout the book of Proverbs and all throughout the Bible. And from that they have these various reasons behind these actions. These are the various reasons in the book of Proverbs of why we should surrender our control to God, why we should go out to reach the needy and the destitute, the disabled. Number one, spiritual growth and fulfillment. Surrendering to God is often seen as a path to spiritual growth. Inner peace, it's a sense of purpose. It's serving others, especially the needy and the disabled. And it's considered a way to express one's faith, to demonstrate the love and the compassion that are part of the higher calling that we receive from Christ. Number two, compassion and empathy. Many Christian teachings emphasize the importance of compassion, empathy towards others, particularly those who are facing difficulties in their life. Serving the needy, serving the disabled community reflects a commitment to caring for others, to addressing their needs, to fostering a sense of community, a sense of interconnectedness. Number three, Proverbs tells us about moral and ethical responsibilities. Various frameworks all throughout the book of Proverbs stress the moral obligation to help those who are less fortunate. This sense of responsibility extends beyond our personal gain. It focuses on contributing to the well-being of society, to promoting justice, to promoting equality. I have, we hear so much today that talks about self-esteem, 
having a healthy self-esteem. And I've scoured the scriptures to find those words, and I finally did find them. I found them in a verse that said, in this one thing we should do, let each esteem others better than himself. If you want true self-esteem, church family, when you begin to esteem others better than yourself, you put them before you, you think about their needs before your needs, you reach out to others, this is what happens, a natural outpouring of that is you will feel different about yourself. You will feel better about yourself. Why? Because you'll know that you're serving a purpose. You're making an eternal difference in the lives of others. That's true self-esteem. Number four, reflecting divine attributes. Serving the needy is a way of embodying the attributes of Jesus and imitating the qualities that he demonstrated while he was still here on earth. This is a reflection of the goodness, the generosity that we know to be inherent in God himself. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Number five, building a just society. Proverbs tells us that engaging with the needy and the disabled is often seen as a means of contributing to creation, of helping form a more just and compassionate society. Number six, the book of Proverbs says ultimately the decision to surrender to God and to reach out to the needy and disabled is shaped by our beliefs. For us, our Christian beliefs, our values, our desire to lead a more purposeful and meaningful life, which is guided by the principles of compassion and selflessness. Or as Jesus said, as you have seen me, your master and your teacher serve, go and do likewise. Church family, I want to commend you because we truly are a church that is reaching the disabled, the poor, and the needy. But could we be doing more? Could we be doing more? In the record of Jesus' ministry in the four Gospels, we see the Savior, we see in the Savior a striking focus upon the ministry among the deaf, the mute, the lame, the blind, and the broader community that they represent. When Jesus was on earth, he went to thousands of people. That's true. In fact, I believe it was the Gospel of John ends with saying, and these are just some of the acts that Jesus did. If we tried to write them all, the, there's not enough books on this world that can contain them. <laughs> but when Jesus went, we, there's 79 people that we can count that he had interactions with, one-on-one or two-on-one interactions with, the woman at the well, uh, the woman with a bleeding disorder, the blind man, Bartimaeus, uh, the, the, the man who was lame. We have these accounts. And among those accounts, only 12 of the 79 were ever in a church. You see, in order to see the need, we need to go outside into the community. We need to get out of the church. We can't just keep ourselves in the four walls with our head in the sand. We've got to get out there and see the need. Jesus went out. Only 12 of them were in the, the temple or the synagogue. The rest were out in the community. And of those, the majority, in fact, we can say all of them, if we count emotional disability or intellectual disability as well, all of them had a disability of some sort. Physical, emotional, emotional in the case of the woman at the well, the spiritual, Jesus went to meet those needs. And so I, with that in mind, I stand before you today as your pastor with a heartfelt plea that resonates the very essence of our community. Our church, a place of unity, a place of worship, a place of solace has always been a haven for all, all believers. We have embraced diversity that enriches our congregation. However, to ensure that every member of our community can truly feel at home, we need to address the need for increased accessibility. We are embarking on a journey, becoming more ADA. What is ADA? American Disabilities Act. Becoming more ADA compliant. It's a step that will not only enhance the inclusivity of our beloved church, but it also reinforces our commitment 
to create a space where everyone can worship freely. This endeavor will require prayer support, a volunteering of time and financial support from each and every one of us. Think about the joys we experience when we come together to celebrate, to pray, to support one another. And now I want you to imagine extending that joy to every member of our community, regardless of their physical abilities or disabilities. By investing in making our church more accessible, we are investing in the well-being of our fellow brothers and sisters, ensuring that no one feels left out. Did you know that on Sunday morning, there are some children that leave and go are rolled in their wheelchair down the hill on the side of the church so that they can be wheeled around back and wheeled into Sunday school. They only come when it's not raining or when there's not bad weather outside. Did you know that there are moms, moms in this service that will say amen when I say this. There are moms, and you'll see them Sunday morning with babies hanging on them, holding children, holding all of the accoutrements that go with raising a kid and trying to maneuver the stairs to go downstairs to bring their kids to Sunday school. There are elderly people in our church that have not been able to get downstairs and see downstairs because they cannot maneuver the stairs. And so we are wanting to be able to make our church more accessible. We are investing in the well-being of our fellow brothers and sisters, ensuring that no one feels left out. Additionally, we need to raise funds and, we, and funds raised will also contribute to much-needed repairs and improvements around our sacred space. On Wednesday night at communion, Wednesday night communion, I sit in the front row, and every Wednesday night when it's raining, I get christened on my bald head because there's this drip, drip, drip. A couple weeks ago, it was even worse. It didn't drip on my head. I got up to go do communion and I looked like I had wet my pants. We need to fix that problem. (laughs) These projects will not only enhance our church, the aesthetics of our church, but it will also provide a more comfortable and secure environment for all who enter. So I urge you today, open your hearts. Open your hearts. Be willing to pray and be a part of this noble cause. Contribute as you're able. Let us demonstrate the strength of our community by coming together to make our church a place where every individual, regardless of physical abilities or disabilities, feels embraced and welcomed. Together, we can create a space that truly reflects the love and the inclusiveness that we preach each Sunday. So I want to thank you for your generosity that you've already shown. We have many ministries, many uh, uh, ways that we are reaching out in our community. But now I want to pray that our collective efforts of coming together will help fortify the foundation of our cherished church. John, would you come as chairman of the board and talk a little bit more about our Jubilee Enhancement? Thank you, Pastor Colson. And also thank you for the vision you have for expanding our capabilities to reach those who uh, need more accessibility, but also to make the environment uh, here in the church more safe. The elders, the trustees, and the treasurer voted unanimously for our comprehensive approach, what we're calling Jubilee Enhancements. Uh, This will be a phased approach and only be done as God provides. First, we'll do accessibility and safety. Then we'll concentrate on preventive maintenance, fix his uh, problem with water leaks. <laughs> Third, reducing monthly costs. And fourth, setting the conditions for the next 50 years. Next month, this church will have been a church for 50 years. It was started with, by a group that wanted to have a church in the community a church that was multi-denominational, a church that would reach more people by allowing different Christian faiths to come together to worship our Lord. We need to expand that capability so that we're able to be here 50 years from now as a vibrant church. And to accomplish this, we'll do it in, uh, in this way. We'll only move when God provides. 
Not, we will not borrow money. We'll not set a dollar amount. We'll not use Jubilee funds for the outreach center. They'll be focused totally on Jubilee enhancements. And we will not use general offering funds for Jubilee enhancement. What, so we are relying on you to pray, to seek God's will, and then respond to Jesus. After all, it's all his. You're invited to the Jubilee Enhancement Forum today at 1215 in the sanctuary with the elders, the trustees, and the treasurer. We will be doing a, a, another forum next week, right after this service, for you to be able to ask your questions and to give us your input. And we ask that you pray over this so that we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, John. Would you join me as we pray this morning? Good and gracious God, we recognize that all of life is a gift and a blessing. We thank you for your most generous love. Encourage us to be people of honesty and integrity, worthy of proclaiming the gospel. And this sacred ministry, help us to open our doors to reach more people. Help us to always revere this sacred space. Give us openness to listen to the needs of our community. Give us joyful spirits and an eagerness to engage with others. Give us a hopeful imagination and a creative vision. Help us to recognize generosity in every gift, even the smallest of gifts. Give us strong, steadfast hearts in times of discouragement. Give us trusting hearts, knowing that the fruits of our labors may not be realized until long after we're gone. Give us a faithful heart deeply committed to your realm. Let us feel your presence so that we know that we are never truly alone. Remind us always that when we do it for the least of these, our brothers and sisters, we do it for you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me as we close out this service this morning?